Hello, I'm Dr. Charles Gardner, Medical Officer of Health with the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, here to provide you with the COVID-19 update for Simcoe Muskoka. So I um, would like um, to offer my condolences to the family members of another individual who has passed away since I last reported, a, uh, a resident with Simcoe Manor, a, uh, a woman in her 80s. Um, I am sorry for your for your loss. So that takes us to um, a total of 10 deaths that we've had in that long-term care facility outbreak. Um, and uh, a total of 50 deaths that we've had in Simcoe County, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit to date. Uh, that means that uh, in the first wave, we had a, uh, a total of 36 deaths. And so far in the second wave, we've had 14 deaths just to give you a, a sense of um, perspective uh, on that particular aspect of the second wave. So um, as of today, we've had 1,455 cases. This is an increase of 154 cases since I last reported a week ago on October the 27th. And um, that is the highest number of cases we've ever had in a single week. And it is therefore higher than the number of cases we've had the week that preceded, uh, which was 126 cases. Um, over the weekend, we had uh, 75 new cases, and this is the highest number we've had over a weekend. And um, in the last 24 hours, we've had an additional 29 cases. If we look at uh, the cases that we've had in the last 24 hours, 25 of them are out in the community as sporadic cases, three are institutional cases, and one is an in, um, from an educational setting. Um, 17 of them are males, 12 are females. Their ages range from under 10 to in their 80s. Uh, 28 of them are in Simcoe County, and one is at this point unknown as to where they live. Three um, were from uh, community acquisition where we don't know how they got their infection. Seven are close contacts of cases, 15 are under investigation, one is part of an educational outbreak, and uh, three are part of uh, institutional outbreaks. 26 are presently in self-isolation at home, one is recovered, and two are in institutions recovering. So. At this point in time, we have 207 active cases, and we've had a total of 1,192 recovered cases. We have seven cases in a hospital, so this is up by two since I last reported. Uh, one is in RVH, two are in Southlake, one is in Headwaters, um, out of district, uh, one is at Georgian Bay General Hospital, and two, at this point in time, we don't have the, um, the actual location on our, our records, and of course, we'll obtain that information. Um, we currently have 13 active outbreaks, up from five last week. So that's a substantial increase in the number of outbreaks. Four of them are in institutions, um, long-term care facilities or retirement homes. Uh, and... Um, Three of them are new in the last week, so I will be getting into the details of them, but they are at uh, Riverwood Senior Living Retirement in Alliston, uh, Granite Ridge Retirement Home in Gravenhurst, and uh, Waterford Retirement in Barrie. Uh, we've also had one of our um, institutional outbreaks declared over in the past week, and that is at Bradford Valley. We continue with one group home in outbreak in Simcoe County. Uh, we have four work in, workplaces in outbreak, which is up from two when I reported last. Uh, three are new in the last week. Two are in manufacturing uh, and, in Barrie and one in um, a uh, agricultural processing plant, uh, actually agricultural setting, not processing plant in Simcoe County. Um, one 
uh, that had been happening is declared over a food processing plant in Simcoe County. We have three um, educational institution outbreaks. So two of them are in, in schools, one a secondary school, Bradford District High School, another in an elementary school, Hillcrest Public School in Barrie. And then we have one in a licensed child care center in Simcoe County. And we don't give the names for um, the outbreaks in uh, child care centers um, as they are privately run uh, facilities, uh, unlike the public institutions for which we provide the names. Um, please be assured that all individuals involved have been contacted directly and informed of the situation and those required to be in isolation are in isolation. Uh, we have an outbreak in a community setting. Um, so this is a um, um, personal service setting, um, a, a hair salon in um, uh, Barrie. And uh, that has involved two uh, individuals who are customers and three individuals who are staff cases. Um, uh, we've been able to reach all customers who are contacts as well as other staff members who are contacted or who are contacts uh, because of the records that they kept with regards to their clientele. And so we um, notified some 95 individuals uh, in order to determine uh, who would need to be in, to, in um, self isolation. And we continue to monitor those individuals. So we continue to see in our cases clusters in households, uh, whether they are households that are family members or whether are, uh, individuals are not related to each other. Uh, formerly, the great majority of these had been in Barrie, but now the new ones that we're seeing are um, elsewhere in Simcoe County. Uh, and we do continue to see in these instances, uh, multi-generational households that are affected when it's family members or um, if it's um, households without family members, young individuals who are students or workers. Uh, we see connections uh, between those outbreaks and uh, work exposures or in some instances, um, work-based um, outbreaks. And uh, so uh, a really key message for us all would be the importance for employers and employees to maintain uh, their infection control practices and uh, for people uh, to restrict their social lives to their household only and otherwise maintain physical distancing and hand washing and self-monitoring for people to be self-monitoring and if they have any symptoms certainly do not go to work do not go to school parents to screen their children um, before they go to school and withhold them from going to school if they have any symptoms and to seek assessment and testing. Um, and to use face coverings or masks in indoor public settings or work settings or in outdoors when you cannot physically distance. All of those things are really critical and uh, play into, I would say, the pattern of what we're seeing of, of cases. And the other thing I would, see, I would say is that the majority of our cases are actually occurring not just in Simcoe County, but in the southern portion of Simcoe County and in Barrie. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing the proximity to the Greater Toronto Area as a factor here. And in many instances where people work out of district to the south of here, where there's a much higher incidence of cases, um, that that too is a, a risk factor uh, for uh, the transmission that we're seeing. We're also seeing a shift in the age pattern. So I'd identify that in the first wave, um, because of the large number of cases in long-term care facilities and the very high incidence of uh, transmission in older people, uh, the average age um, was in the 50s for our cases. And then as we moved into the summer and into um, August, uh, and even in September, particularly in September, uh, the age um, average age of our cases dropped by some 20 years and um, during the month of uh, September it was actually uh, 33 years on average 
And now in October, because we're seeing uh, cases in long-term care facilities and also older individuals in the community, uh, the um, age has gone up again. Our average age now is 44 years. So it's gone up by another decade. As we know, um, people who are older are at a much greater risk of complications, severe manifestation of infection and mortality, hospital admission, ICU admission. Uh, so it's certainly of concern to me that we're starting to see quite an increase in the average age of cases. We do also know that um, increased transmission in the community puts our long-term care facilities at risk. The higher the incidence in, in the community, the greater likelihood of transmission uh, spilling over and affecting long-term care facilities and resulting in outbreaks. Um, we uh, continue to have exposures in our schools. So uh, we've had 47 instances where individuals um, who've been cases have been in the school environment affecting 34 schools. And now we have um, two outbreaks in school environments that I've already cited. Uh, so that, as I said, is new. Before the, the last week, we had lots of exposures, but no um, evidence of transmission, no outbreaks. Um, if we look at our dashboard on our website, um, you will see that our overall status is still yellow, unchanged from last week. Uh, it's broken down into four categories. So the category of viral spread and containment remains red as we continue to have an elevation in cases and in uh, our incidence of cases. Um, laboratory testing is yellow, which is unchanged. And this is all about uh, the turnaround time for our laboratory tests, was which um, remains um, be between two to three days on average. Uh, our healthcare system capacity remains unchanged at a yellow status uh, because of high occupancy in our hospitals, um, almost completely unrelated to COVID-19. Uh, though I did note that we, we have had um, some increase in the actual admission to hospitals related to COVID-19, but most of that is just due to the provision of standard care. Uh, and um, the, the category of public health system capacity has changed to yellow from red. Uh, and this is because we've actually had some improvement in our ability to respond to contacts uh, within the required day, 24 hours. So, um, We've increased uh, to 82.7% of our new high-risk contacts being contacted within a day, which was 72.8%, the goal being greater than 90%. Uh, we've been able to do this in large part because we've been uh, taking advantage of a service provided by Public Health Ontario and Stats Canada to do contact tracing on our behalf. So that's increased our capacity. But I would say that that's something we need to watch very closely as cases and contacts goes up. We um, will become, I think, challenged again on this front. If we look at our trajectory over time, um, last week, our incidence of cases was 23.9 cases per 100,000 population over the week, which is up quite significantly from the week before at 18.7. Uh, and compared with the province, um, we remain a now a little bit over half of the provincial rate. Province in the last week being 43.2 cases per 100,000 population over the week. And the, the week before, 41.9 cases per 100,000 population over the week. Uh, so we've gone up quite significantly. The province has gone up too. We're going up at this point at a more rapid rate than the province. Um, our average growth rate is 1.5%, which is up from the previous week of 1.3%. And um, this is to be compared, this is the daily growth rate. This would be compared with the province's rate of 1.2, which is actually slightly down from 1.3%. Uh, so it speaks once again to the fact that at this point we're having a more rapid rise than the province as a whole. Our um, effective reproduction rate is 1.3, which 
which is up from 1.1 last week, or sorry, 1.0 last week. Um, and as I said before, um, anything above one means that the pandemic is growing here. It's not slowing, it's not declining, it's growing. So we definitely want to get this back down to one or less. Uh, the province's effective reproductive number right now uh, is uh, 0 0.9 down point down from 1.1 when I reported a week ago. Our doubling time, how long it would take for us to double the number of cases that we have has declined, has decreased. And of course that means that we're accelerating at this point in terms of the pandemic. So it's down to 47.8 days. So in 47.8 days, if we continued at the rate of um, cases that we're having now, we would double the number that we would have. So just under, and, and, and that's up from last week. Last week it was 59.1 days. So um, once again, this speaks to us increasing our pace of growth at this time. If I um, turn to our institutional outbreaks and other outbreaks, they are as follows. We presently have four outbreaks up from three uh, from last week. Um, so one is a continuation of Simcoe Manor uh, and uh, they have some additional cases, unfortunately, over the last few days. Um, we have one additional case among staffs, so there are up to 29 cases in total, and two additional cases among residents, so up to 42. Uh, and as I said before, we've had one additional death at that facility. Um, as I've pointed out before, um, there's been a lot of assistance provided in the response to this outbreak and I would like to commend Simcoe County for um, providing their additional resources. Uh, they are the operator of the facility and also um, Stevenson Memorial for um, resourcing that they provide and uh, very much would like to thank RVH and commend RVH for um, providing the management, leadership, um, additional uh, human resources, including uh, medical resources, physicians, uh, and infectious disease uh, specialists, infection control practitioners, um, and um, as I said before, leadership and management resources. Uh, so um, it's very much a collaborative effort, continuing uh, very tight um, communication and work among the parties involved. And certainly we as a health unit are very much there as well. So uh, testing has been done throughout the facility and repeated and uh, the next time staff are to be tested again, all of them will be November the 9th. Um, we uh, have uh, all positive cases in isolation and droplet precaution. Uh, we've completed um, terminal cleaning in um, the Nottawasaga unit and some common areas of that facility uh, and otherwise remain with droplet precautions for the residents and uh, a full application of personal protective equipment for the staff in the response. With regards to our other outbreaks uh, in our uh, institutions, they are as follows. Uh, Riverwood Senior Living Retirement Home in Alliston had an outbreak with declared on October the 27th with one staff member who is positive. Universal um, testing being done for uh, staff and residents and awaiting uh, results uh, for um, about half, half of the uh, staff are awaiting the results. Um, the others have come back negative. Uh, we have an outbreak at Granite Ridge Retirement Residence in Gravenhurst declared on October the 27th with one positive staff case and one positive resident uh, and um, testing being applied to all staff and all residents, control measures in place. And uh, that was de declared on October the 21st. And then uh, the Waterford Retirement Residence in Barrie outbreak declared on November the 2nd with one positive resident. Um, and in that instance, uh, that individual had been kept in isolation and so 
um, had not had contact um, without any protection uh, uh, for any, any other individual in the facility. So we maintain control in that facility and are managing it uh, uh, with the usual approach of testing individuals involved and the requirement for personal protective equipment and um, other control measures. So I mentioned that we have three institutional outbreaks as, as what we categorize as institutional outbreaks um, uh, to report on. So two are in schools, one has um, uh, one of them is at Bradford District High School with three students um, testing positive involving um, a class that was affected and uh, all individuals within that uh, class are on isolation and follow-up testing. Um, I would, I should really, really say that uh, I'd like to extend my condolences to uh, people at that school because uh, there was a, uh, a death that took place on completely unrelated to COVID-19, but did affect um, that, uh, that school. So my condolences to everybody in, involved. Um, another outbreak in a school, Hillcrest Public School in Barrie declared on November the 2nd uh, with two students um, and uh, we've identified all um, all individuals who are contacts in that situation and they are in home uh, self-isolation uh, and recommendation for follow-up testing and uh, otherwise I indicated that the third facility is a child care um, facility in, in, um, in Barrie and that was declared on November the 2nd. And uh, as, as is our usual practice, we do not provide the name of uh, outbreaks in uh, childcare centers, uh, given that they're private providers. We, we stick with um, public institutions for the provision of such information or the uh, provision of that information where you've had um, exposure and we haven't been able to identify all people that we need to contact. In this instance, we've been able to contact all people involved. Uh, we have um, a group home uh, in Simcoe County with an ongoing outbreak. It was declared on October the 17th, so I'd spoken to that before. Uh, that involves six staff members who are cases. That's up by one from when I last reported. Uh, all staff members have been uh, sent for testing uh, with ne negative results otherwise or uh, results pending in uh, two instances and uh, the residents themselves have not been tested because of their physical condition um, were instead uh, monitoring for symptoms and would manage accordingly depending on uh, the development of symptoms. Um, with regards to community settings with outbreaks we have a personal service setting hair salon uh, and uh, as I'd indicated uh, before, I'd provided some basic information about that. Um, so I think I'll go on to other workplace outbreaks. We have four workplace outbreaks up from two when I last reported. Uh, so one is um, a manufacturing facility in Simcoe County that was declared on the 21st of October which I've reported on before. They now have 27 confirmed cases among their staff, up from 23. Uh, and um, there have been no uh, exposures to other members of the community. We've otherwise identified all individuals involved. The community um, has been closed since October the 23rd, uh, awaiting um, uh, further further management of the outbreak and awaiting uh, outcomes of, of test results. Uh, we have um, another manufacturing facility in Barrie, which was declared as an outbreak on October the 28th with three staff members, uh, testing of all others at the facility um, and negative results on the majority of those. Uh, and uh, two results uh, pending. We have another uh, manufacturing facility de 
in Barrie declared on October the 31st uh, with four staff members that are positive uh, and uh, otherwise all other, other individuals being um, tested and monitored. And uh, we have an agricultural facility in Simcoe County declared on October the 29th uh, with um, three staff members and uh, all other staff members have been tested and uh, their results are negative. I'd also like to say that we had a food processing facility uh, that I'd reported on last week in Simcoe County with a total of 24 cases, uh, which was declared over on uh, November the 2nd. With regards to some key questions that have come up and key matters that have come up, um, we've been advised by the province to emphasize certain key messages for the public and uh, I think they're excellent key messages. The kinds of key messages I've been giving all along so they are as follows. Um, first off that you should uh, stick to your household as contacts, limit your contacts to your households. If you live alone and adopt another household to be part of but otherwise limit yourself to your household. Uh, and otherwise maintain physical distancing from other people two meters distance, uh, use of mask or face covering in indoor settings or if you cannot physically distance outdoors. Um, and uh, people need to be careful about driving together or carpooling. Um, avoid it if you can. If you cannot, then if you're if there are people outside of your household, you need to be physically distanced if you can. So. One person in the back, one person in the front, both wearing face coverings, uh, having a window open uh, to improve air circulation. Um, they're recommending minimizing um, trips to public settings. So certainly there are key reasons why people need to go out, like shopping and work, um, or attending school or physical activity. Um, but otherwise people need to think twice about such things and uh, the province in the past has also recommended um, that people avoid travel outside of your community as well, if, if, if possible. Um, screening of your children before they go to school. So make sure that your children use the province's or our screening tool uh, to make sure you're not sending your children to school with any symptoms whatsoever um, for COVID-19. Uh, and same with your, for yourself with regards to going to work. Screen yourself. If you have any symptoms, do not go to work and seek assessment. Use a face covering in indoor public places or workplaces, especially workplaces if you cannot physically distance, and this is actually by direction, directive from the province. Um, and um, just a couple of things that I would note. We've got, uh, last week I spoke to our findings about clusters and cases associated with Thanksgiving. So um, we did an assessment of our data. We enumerated the number of cases and clusters associated with Thanksgiving gatherings. I reported on it verbally. Um, we went back and uh, made, made sure of our numbers and actually found some more cases. And these, these cases are actually people out of jurisdiction. So beyond the cases that we have locally, uh, which was a total of 47, um, which is 14% of all of the cases that we've had since Thanksgiving. We've had a total of 340 cases since Thanksgiving, so or the, in the 14 days following Thanksgiving. Um, uh, 47 of them from within Simcoe Muskoka were associated with um, having uh, gatherings at, um, at Thanksgiving. And... Um, in all, there were a total of 23, 23 such gatherings of uh, contacts of up to uh, 16 people uh, associated with these gatherings. But we also noted an additional 15 people um, from out of jurisdiction. So people who were cases who either came here for such gatherings or people from here who went out of district to somewhere else for, for such gatherings. So they make an additional 15 cases associated with Thanksgiving gatherings in, in Simcoe, Muskoka. So that's a total of 63 cases. Um, 
we're putting our analysis on this up on our website hopefully later today under our health, stat, health stats page. So please um, have a look at that. We certainly um, feel that it's an important message for people. And it is something we're going to be citing uh, going through the holiday season um, to remind people of the risk of getting together in this way and the importance of limiting yourself to your household and doing physical distancing otherwise and rem remote communication otherwise. I know it's very difficult and feels very unnatural for people and it's hard on people and I count myself in that number of people who have difficulty with this um, but we see the the results of this and we know that of those cases there are some who um, were high risk older people quite severely affected so it, it's something that we need to know about and and take to heart and act on so the Premier today at one o'clock announced a new framework for um, action on COVID-19 uh, throughout the province, a way of determining what um, protective measures need to be in place in each of the health units based on uh, their disease transmission profile and um, risk categorization. Uh, vulnerability based on uh, impact on local healthcare systems, um, certainly the incidence of cases and um, the reproductive number, the kind of data that I cited at the very beginning of my, my presentation. And I noted that in our own um, dashboard that we have for ourselves here in Simcoe, Muskoka, we, we place ourselves at a yellow alert out of a, a red, yellow, and green um, framework of our own. So the province now has its own framework with five levels, uh, green, which is what they've called prevent, yellow, which is protect, orange, which is restrict, red, which is control, and then something they're calling lockdown, which would be beyond red. Uh, so certainly we at Simca Muskoka are gonna be monitoring this very closely. Uh, um, I note in that document, they've actually indicated that Simca Muskoka would be green, but when I look at the data indicators, um, and apply them to ourselves, I, in my opinion, we would actually belong in yellow, much like our own dashboard. Um, and I've communicated this to the province uh, already. Uh, and I would say that the kinds of control measures that they have in place for yellow, I think would suit us well uh, in Simcoe Muskoka. Um, Uh, I have something very important to announce now, and that is that effective immediately I've issued an order to all of our long-term care facilities, um, not our retirement homes, but our long-term care facilities, requiring visitation now be restricted to only essential visitors. So every resident can have up to two family members identified as essential visitors in order to come in and assist with their care. Um, so um, as is the case in Toronto and Peel and Ottawa, where the province has directed that there be that restriction, by my order, we're now uh, applying that same restriction here in Simcoe, Muskoka. Um, and also I'm prohibiting residents from going on visits off of the premises. It can go for medical appointments, but not for visits. Same restriction as the province has applied in those other municipalities that I've just cited. My reason for this is because we're uh, essentially at um, a, a level of 25 cases per 100,000 population per week. And from what I've seen of um, a review uh, done by the Sci Scientific Advisory Committee for the province. 25 is an action level um, that's important for the province to consider for decisions such as that. And also I'm very concerned that as the rate goes up, the risk goes up to these facilities. And we've had a significant number of our facilities affected by um, being in outbreak status. Uh, and of course, Simcoe Manor being a very large outbreak with a large number of deaths. Um, and um, I, I want to strike a balance of protection that also um, addresses the mental health and quality of life needs of residents. So 
with this approach, we're um, increasing protection for these facilities and for the people in these facilities, for the residents and for the staff, while still allowing that kind of critical visitation by key family members um, so that um, needs can be met, the needs of, uh, of these residents. Uh, we um, will monitor this closely and um, also monitor what the province chooses to do as well and what other uh, health units choose to do and um, certainly monitor uh, our rates of disease here and the overall risk pattern here um, and um, determine whether or not we would need to do anything different. I've already cited that we're not applying this to retirement homes or to group homes. So that's one of the things that we need to monitor really very, very closely. We've at this point chosen to focus on the facilities that are at greatest risk of all, which is the long-term care facilities. Um, we note the importance of people having the flu shot. It's important every year. It's particularly important this year in that we want to avoid influenza activity at the same time as COVID-19 activity. We certainly want to avoid individuals getting both at the same time. Uh, as individuals, I'm sure you would want, if you can, to avoid getting influenza. And this is something you can do that makes a real difference. And certainly you would want to avoid um, having both COVID-19 and influenza at the same time, or the confusion that would arise from having influenza and not knowing without testing whether it's that or whether it's COVID-19. So we do encourage testing, but we also note that there's been a tremendous uptake in vaccination this year, much higher than previous years at this time of year, or perhaps four or five times the uptake that there had been by this point in the year. And so um, we're seeing that um, there's difficulty in um, pharmacies and family physicians in being able to keep up with the demand. Vaccine continues to come. It comes in installments over time uh, through the month of November. And uh, we uh, hear from communication from the province that they're um, seeking to get more vaccine in response to the demand. Um, so I would ask people to continue to monitor um, uh, look for your opportunity to get your vaccine uh, and um, to know that it is coming to please be assured that the vaccine is coming and get your vaccine get your vaccination when you can. So some questions from the media. You have uh, two educational setting outbreaks and then only go into detail below about schools by name, what information is available, but the other educational setting and what will be routinely disclosed. So as I'd cited already, I've already mentioned the names of the two schools that are um, in outbreak and the other is uh, child care center. Uh, and otherwise um, we will not be disclosing further information. Uh, just to reassure you that we've contacted all affected individuals um, and um, uh, that all necessary precautionary um, measures have been taken for that setting. And I re already indicated um, our approach to that, that we give information about public institutions, um, but private institutions we do not unless it's necessary to do so uh, because we haven't been able to identify all people exposed. And in this case, um, we've been able to do that because of their records. Uh, a parent of a student at Banting is upset, upset that they were only informed recently via a letter that there was a case at the school, but that the person who has COVID-19 is returning to the school tomorrow. The concern is that the 14-day quarantine isn't being enforced. How is that determined and why a lag in time until information of cases is shared with parents? So. In this instance, what we had was an individual who was a potential case um, who was on home in isolation, uh, who did not um, attend uh, the school uh, until sometime later, or sorry, didn't attend the school while they had been um, um, symptomatic and um, 
did uh, eventually seek testing. We'd advise testing, they sought testing, but it was some time into their illness, a significant duration of time into their illness before they got their test and got the result back. So by the time we got the result back, it was a relatively short period of time uh, of incubation for the contacts. So we put out the notice so that the contacts would know and so that they would know that they needed to uh, seek testing and certainly if they had symptoms to, um, to isolate themselves to avoid further spread. Um, there hasn't been to date any uh, evidence of spread in this situation. Um, and of course we're monitoring the situation closely. So um, because of the timing, it turned out to be uh, a short period of time after the notice that went out that the incubation period was over. And thus that individual uh, who had been, that, that person's period of communicability had passed and they could return to school. Um, how will our COVID-19 experience drive improvements in the social determinants of health, especially in Muskoka? So this is where our COVID-19 impact survey comes into play. A week ago, I'd identified that we have this survey up on our website where we wish to hear from people in the community about your own experience with COVID-19 and how it's impacted on your life and your well-being and your life circumstances. And all of that is important for us to understand um, how COVID-19 is impacting on the determinants of health, the basic conditions of people's lives um, that determine their health. And uh, we've had over a thousand people respond to that survey, which is an enormous response. We normally expect perhaps 300 responses. So that's a, a really a, a wonderful response that we've had to that survey. And about 20% of those are from Muskoka. So we've got an excellent response. I would say we're still welcoming more response. We would, uh, in particular, given the profile of what we've received so far, welcome more men responding to the survey, um, more um, people of South, Southern Simcoe responding to the survey, people of difficult life circumstances responding to the survey. Uh, but uh, so far we've had a very brisk response. We will analyze those responses, that data, and provide a report. We will make that available on our website. I will announce it when it goes up on our website. Um, it can be used by partner agencies or members of the public for advocacy for change. We ourselves could use it for advocacy for, for change uh, of services or supports. Um, and uh, it can also influence how we provide our own services. Um, so we're hopeful that, um, uh, that that will make a difference and certainly grateful for people's particip participation in that survey. So at this point, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, I believe, let me have a look at my notes. Um, we had three cases. Okay. Um, two students and a staff member or? So, you know, in order in order to, when we get small numbers, um, we identify how much information we'll give and if, if it's too fine, the granularity of the information, there's the potential to identify individuals and then we withhold it. So I think I'll withhold response to that question. That's a good question. I think because of um, because of the pandemic response unit at RVH, they would have this quite a substantial ability to respond. 
um, perhaps 50 cases uh, would be uh, uh, the capacity that they would have. And that is a resource for the district. So um, I think what might be more of a challenge is the number of ICU cases and the number of ventilator cases. Um, at this point, I don't have a tangible number for you on that, but I think that's a really worthy question for me to drill down on and uh, give a better answer to uh, in, the, in the future. You mm -hmm. said you let the province know you think Simcoe Muscova should be probably in a yellow uh, zone. How likely is that uh, to happen by, by the release on Saturday? I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, this is it's their framework as they apply it. Um, it's new, too. It's just come out. Uh, we'll see what response I get. So at this point, I don't know. Well, can you expand on, on which of those control measures you see as being important for the region? Um, so on my quick read of it, it did speak to um, uh, some enhancements with regards to seating at restaurants. Uh, a reduction to six people per table is one of the things that jumped out at me, taking the names of, I think it was taking the names of all the people who attend. Um, so that was that was just a quick impression that I saw as being something that was reasonable. A, uh, uh, a reduction in uh, gym class sizes, uh, I believe, was one of the measures. Um, not an elimination of the classes, but reduction in their sizes, an increase of the spacing uh, between people to, I think it was three meters. So the, those were a couple of key things that jumped out at me. And I, I should say, I would just note right off the bat, though, that although they jump out at me, we haven't actually seen evidence of transmission in those settings here as yet. They've been issues in other jurisdictions, but we haven't actually seen that yet in our data. Okay, and, and one of the um, controls proposed in uh, yellow for recreation mm -hmm. facilities is reducing the number of people uh, indoors to 10. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that as it applies to arenas. Is that something that you'd like to see hmm. also indoors in arenas? Because I think it would, it would really impact like hockey and skating programs heading into the winter. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think I would need the opportunity to, to look at that in more depth, both with my staff, but also with our municipal contacts. Uh, you know, I meet with the CAOs of our municipalities weekly, and at times they've expressed concerns about uh, change rooms and how they're used or um, uh, maintaining a physical distancing uh, with uh, venues such as uh, curling arenas, that type of thing, or, or cohorting people staying in their own groupings and not mixing with other people. So those have been some matters that have been raised to me before and that we've sought to support them on with um, written communication uh, to help them. Um, but when it comes to these other details, I think I'd like the opportunity to go over those, those details with, uh, with those contacts. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Jessica Owen from Barry today. Go ahead, please.
Mm-hmm. I'm just wondering if we talked before about this partitioning off. Is it a, is it a possibility you could be looking at if you consider moving a, into different zones? Um, I think that's a challenging topic. I see the argument because of, there is indeed a substantial difference in the incidence of cases in Muskoka versus Simcoe, and in particular South Simcoe. Uh, my understanding from my contacts at the province is that so far they've applied they've they've applied their requirements to an entire health unit and they're still thinking in those terms. I guess I would point out that when they were moving through the stages and opening up at certain points within um, Windsor, Essex, they actually uh, applied restrictions to sub areas within Windsor, Essex. So it's not as though they don't have any precedent at all for that approach. Um, but um, the communication I'm getting at this time is that they're looking to apply it to the entire district. So. We shall see, and I've actually communicated um, to my contacts at the province that sentiment, um, a desire for some difference between Muskoka versus Simcoe or uh, the southern portion of Simcoe, but um, my understanding is that at this point they're thinking in terms of entire health units. So my main contact with municipalities is through their CAOs, and I meet with them every week, Thursday mornings. It's an excellent, invaluable venue for me, two-way communication, and I um, will indeed be taking this topic to that venue. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've, um, and this is, this can be problematic when you get into small numbers and the potential to identify people. Uh, what I will say is that in our outbreaks to date, we've not had teachers as cases in this, in the schools, those two outbreaks. That actually answers my second question. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Mike Arsonides from CTV, go ahead, please. Yeah, the one guy who's never on me. Uh, doctor, hello, how are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. I got the question now. Did anything in particular spark this decision now to oppose the restrictions on the long term care home? Was it the lack of cases now in the last two weeks among residents at Simcoe Manor, all of a sudden getting two residents in one day? Or was this just an overall seeing the trend here of cases surge in the community? So I've been prepared over the last two weeks to move on an order and have been watching closely the case count overall as well as the outbreaks, the potential for more outbreaks. I've been very concerned um, because we know that one of the major drivers of outbreaks happening in long-term care is transmission in the community. So um, I've been prepared for that long. We did have rising cases very rapidly rising th- between three weeks ago and two weeks ago and then it seemed to, to level off and go down slightly so i held off and now it's taking off again so my main concern is the trajectory and where it's headed uh, and certainly the outbreak um, at simcoe manor uh, was of great concern to me the potential for it once it gets into a facility being very big with um, serious illness and mortality is my main concern and I wish to avoid it at all costs. Well, not at all costs, because one needs to balance um, you know, the, the impacts of restriction on visitation, but certainly I, I wish to avoid it. And this would be an indefinite uh, move here until we see numbers drop? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question about when we would discontinue. I would want it to be declining again. I would like it to be well below 25 cases per 100,000 population. If you were to deliver a message to our audience tonight on TV at 6 o'clock, what do you have to say to our audience about right now what is happening in the community and what their level of concern should be compared to what it was maybe two weeks ago when we said it was plateauing a bit? I would say it is most definitely rising um, and uh, rising at a rate that's of great concern to me and that speaks to the fact that there's a, a high degree of transmission particularly in southern Simcoe and in Barrie and that people need to exercise the precautions that we, I've been saying all along which is since September sticking to your household as contacts and otherwise having physical distancing for everybody else that you encounter two meters distance from people, using a face covering when you're in indoor public spaces and workspaces, hand washing, self-monitoring if you develop any illness to stay at home and seek assessment and testing, do the same for your children. We all need to do our part at the end of the day. All these other restrictions that are put in place are really meant to support that, support those key basic measures of physical distancing, hand hygiene, face coverings, and self-monitoring and isolation. Everything is meant to support that. And if we can together implement all of that, we can gain control of this pandemic again and flatten the curve and bring it back down. If I can steal Jessica Owen's question, uh, can I ask you here, what which point do we move toward possibly closing an entire school? What needs to happen mm. in a school to go from outbreak to full closure, let's say, for two weeks? We would need to see evidence that it's not under control, that we're getting more cases happening that aren't linked to the original case um, and uh, would give the appearance that it's widespread transmitting through the school. So if we get that kind of pattern, then we would be uh, looking to either close a school for a time or if we can identify a section of the school affected, close that section, that, that particular grouping of students and teachers. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, if it appears to be widespread and not coming under control, then we would be closing a school. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, they're not, actually. Um, Long-term care facilities are for people that need fairly intensive care. Retirement homes are for individuals who are fairly independent, able to come and go, um, just need some assistance, uh, easier uh, circumstances for, uh, for their general living, but otherwise uh, don't require intensive care. Uh, last week and now a resident uh, this week, or I guess uh, uh, last week anyway, um, is, is it uh, coincidence or is it likely that uh, something's happened that there's uh, uh, the testing may yet uh, reveal? Well, a concern always, sorry, uh, sorry. sorry to cut you off. Please finish your question and then I'll respond. Um, our concern is for the potential for transmission on site. Um, a link between the cases uh, and so uh, when we see, actually in this province right now, if you get a single case of COVID-19, it's considered an outbreak by definition from the province. But certainly with two cases, you've got the potential for transmission to between them and to others. And so that's when we put in place our control measures and required testing of everybody involved um, and enhanced infection prevention and control uh, to avoid any further transmission. So that's our concern with this outbreak like it would be with, with any outbreak. But you don't see anything right now on the statistics regarding this, eh? 
so far we've got the two cases that have tested positive and we continue to monitor testing for everybody involved in the premises. Okay, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Um, is there anyone else on the line who I may have missed? Uh, hi, Kathy. It's Adrian from my staff. Oh, hi, Adrian. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, no, sorry, I joined in a bit late. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a quick question about the, uh, the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know if there's, you know, over 37 million people in the country and the um, pharmacies are continually running out of these. How many of these um, doses have been ordered and how long is it going to take to get these things here? Um, so uh, each province handles it in their own way. So it would be more appropriate to look at the number of people in Ontario, which is, I think, 15 million people, more than 15 million people in the province or around that number. Um, and the province has indicated, I think, that they had close to f enough for 40% of the population. They had an increase of, uh, relative increase of about 15% uh, of the doses. Um, and it comes in in installments over time through the month. But right now we've had a, a surge in demand that exceeded the immediate availability of vaccine. Um, more is coming. We're hopeful that there would be enough, but it is possible that you'll get a demand in um, uh, a demand in vaccination that would exceed the total amount. My understanding is the province is able to order more if they need to. Uh, would it be a, a better idea for some people to make an appointment with their doctor than? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's an individual choice. It would have the advantage of being more certain about uh, when and how you'll get your vaccine as opposed to calling into a pharmacy and finding out when they're available and that kind of thing. Uh, people have either options. Certainly, I'd, I'd, uh, it would encourage people to reach out to their family physician. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Adrian. Is there anyone else on the line we may have missed? With that, we will bid you a good afternoon, and we will see you next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.